I was going to say, I haven't heard applause since the before times. Yeah. I also don't need another podcast to listen to, uh, but I'm a glutton for punishment. So I have found and subscribed to Behind the Bastards. That looks interesting. So thanks for that. I saw that in the, in the chat there. Um, yeah, and, uh, another before times thing. You know, I haven't given a whole lot of talks since we went to virtual conferences. And, um, you know, the other day I was rummaging through a drawer of cables and knickknacks and stuff, and I found a presentation remote. <laughs> I couldn't remember the last time I've needed one of those. Like, I'm, you know, if I'm presenting virtually, I'm right here in front of the keyboard. I'm just going to use the arrow keys. Um, yes, but um, as he said, uh, feel free to drop in your uh, questions, uh, outrage, uh, and anything else that you're you're feeling that you need to get out into that chat, I'll be I'll be watching both that. And it looks like I have to click a tab to look at the Q and A, but I can I can check that from time to time, so that works. All right, so let's see. Let's get started. I presume you can see my screen screen there. It looks like you can. <clears throat> so my background, uh, some of you know me. Um, I, I've I'm a generalist. Uh, I've always kind of enjoyed it that way. I'm kind of fascinated by anything anything new. I collect gadgets and and things like that. I've, I mean, if you see the table behind me, there there's three laptops there, uh, a remarkable uh, writing tablet, a Surface Duo that I got <laughs> not too long ago when they dropped down to three hundred four hundred dollars, uh, just because I, I was super curious about having a, a dual screen uh, Android device. Um, so my career kind of reflects that, uh, kind of ADHD mentality of everything's interesting. I can't focus on any one thing for too long, so I'm going to bounce around. Uh, so don't let the 10 years as a security practitioner fool you. I did a lot of things, wore a lot of hats, uh, in, in that time. Um, and I found there's value in that, you know, which is, which is great. Um, you know, kind of getting that big picture view of how things work in the industry has uh, has really helped me out a lot in my career. I also founded some local cy cybersecurity community groups uh, that you're also possibly probably aware of besides Knoxville, DC-865, uh, which I'm grateful somebody else is running. I only ran it for really the first year. I didn't have time. And then TenSec, which is kind of like a, a meta group, uh, but it's also a nonprofit. Uh, you know, that uh, helps out with uh, OWASP, with DC-865, uh, and is the, the backing for B-Sides Knoxville. And we found it's really nice to have a nonprofit. Everything's cheaper. Some things are free. Uh, it's, it's great. So if you're curious uh, about more security stuff and you're not already involved with one of these groups, uh, DC-865 meet, meets once a month. Uh, TenSec has a Slack that anybody can join. And besides Knoxville is typically every year in early May. Uh, we'll see if we're able to do physical again. I'm already starting to see tons of conferences go virtual after planning to be physical. So who knows? Who knows? Six months away is is a lifetime these days. Um, which is it, it? It's kind of funny. Some of the research I did for this, diving back into old talks that I've done and things like that, uh, just seems seems like forever ago. Um, so in the, the very early days of InfoSec, uh, there wasn't a whole lot going on. Uh, and security departments existed, um, but they, they were, their responsibilities and, and, and what they covered was, was pretty small. So typically, you know, we had some concept of network security, firewalls were around, um, vulnerability management was starting to emerge. Um, IDS IPS uh, was was kind of a thing, you know, was starting to emerge. Antivirus was probably the most mature technology. And then incident response wa wasn't terribly formal yet at that point. Um, I forget when SANS came out with their 504 course, but I remember taking it in 2005, and it was still fairly new. So, um, so yeah, a lot of this stuff was was very, very new. Uh, but then the the threats weren't what they are today, you know. So generally, the the big hack of the day was defacing websites. Usually, it was uh, people messing around or 
um, activists, you know, trying to get their, their message out about whatever, you know, and they hack into a web server and replace the, you know, the main page index.htm with, uh, with whatever their message was, you know, which oftentimes was do better at security. <laughs> it's just um, completely different from what we're seeing today. Uh, in the time between, you know, I guess we're talking about 19, late, late 90s, and now InfoSec has grown to become this kind of monolithic, um, you know, thinkscape that covers pretty much anything. Like it's not even just IT anymore. You know, if you, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll share this afterwards. Um, I know you guys can't can't click any of those link, links. Uh, I should have shared it before actually, so you could you could follow along with this, but um, and and open some of these links. Maybe what I can do is I can drop them in the chat as, as we go through. Can I do that? Is that going to work? Uh, if it doesn't take too much time, I'll, I'll do it. Let's see. So there's there's the link there. Um, it covers everything. You know, it covers um, the HR side of things. It covers uh, policy, PR, marketing. Um, and InfoSec is really this secondary layer on top of anything and everything. Most of the investigations I worked uh, when I was back on the enterprise side uh, was for HR. You know, it was stupid stuff going on internally with employees uh, where we were investigating the employees. You know, not, not even really what you would consider cybersecurity. Um, let's see. So I feel kind of strongly that an early mistake we made in InfoSec <clears throat> was that um, security gradually became the place for anything with security in the name. Uh, and, and this was a big problem because it allowed people to kind of psychologically shrug it off and to say, okay, well, security is not my problem anymore, anymore, you know, toss it over the wall. And that was a big issue because, you know, if you look at this, this last slide, we can't do all that, not without help. So, you know, I, I started to think about this, you know, and I came up with this, this idea that uh, we, we kind of had to shift it back uh, where if you're an asset owner, if you're responsible for uh, a code repository or, you know, systems or wh whatever the assets are that you have responsibility for, you should have security responsibility for those assets uh, for many reasons. First of all, nobody knows them better than you. You're the subject mat matter expert on those. Uh, you understand the constraints. You understand, uh, you know, where, where the bodies are buried, where the duct tape is applied. You know, no, you can't cut that string because the whole thing will collapse. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, so it's it's really not constructive for somebody in security that doesn't know any of your code or your systems, you know, to just uh, throw these recommendations back over the wall at you. Uh, it's created a lot of animosity in, in security. Uh, relationships have, have uh, became very common, almost uh, kind of a running joke for relationships to be awful between security and, and the rest of the rest of IT, at least, if not the rest of the business. You know, we, we came to be called the, the Department of No. Um, we wouldn't accept any kind of workarounds or mitigations, like security had to be perfect. So it's really kind of unhealthy, uh, you know, mindsets and philosophies, you know, started started to grow. And, um, and we've been fighting back against that ever since. Um, so there are these uh, these great. I don't I don't think you'll be able to hear this if I play this. Can you hear it? Okay, you can't. All right, yeah. So this this first one, you know, it's basically. Have you ever watched the movie you wanted to whenever you wanted to? You know, so here back in 1993, they're basically like, hey, Netflix is going to be a thing. Uh, so I love these things. Yeah, AT&T kind of really nailed, like they're thinking about, th this is when the internet was brand new. And, and most of the, the stuff in these ads came out of, well, what what is that connectivity going to give us uh, that we don't have today when we combine it with current technology or even 
you know, maybe 10 years in the future. And, and some of them are hilariously wrong, but some of them they got really right. You know, so this is basically remote learning, Zoom. Um, <laughs> for some reason, they thought we were going to be doing video calls from, uh, from phone booths. Who knows? It's funny because some of these actually contradict each other. Like they're smart enough to know that you'd have a tablet device that you'd be doing stuff from that would wirelessly connect, you know, but not smart enough to realize that you'd be doing video calls on, on the mobile device, not at a, at a phone booth. So uh, they're really funny, but they, you know, the thing that they kind of drive home is, is that this was a, a change in thinking. When the internet was introduced, it really kind of shifted what would be possible in the near future. And almost 100% of what they introduced here, it happened in some form in the future. Only a couple of them didn't like, uh, you know, they, they said you'd be updating your driver's license from an ATM. And, um, you know, most of them did though. And certainly that would be possible. You know, the, the things they didn't think through were regulations and things like that you know, and, and laws, the legal side of thing uh, that made some of those not happen. And kind of as we break down IT and we think in, in these different eras that we've had in, in computing and, and certainly from a, you know, a sysadmin kind of perspective here, uh, you know, very early part of my career, first uh, six, seven years, I, I, I was essentially a sysadmin, you know, I, I wore a whole bunch of other hats as well. Uh, but this is kind of how I think of it, you know, and I, I really got into uh, career proper, you know, corporate career in, in 2001, well, really 1999, 2000, 2001. And this is kind of how I think about it, you know, but in reality, none of this stuff ever goes away. So it looks more like this. So it's not just that we have all these new possibilities, all these new paradigms, you know, that are showing up over time. Um, you know, Linux and Windows was a huge one, you know, in terms of agility and what we're talking about today. Um, you know, the Linux and Windows folks were able to run circles around everybody else because, you know, they could just order, you know, off the shelf hardware, you know, install Windows or Linux on it and, and they're up and running. You know, they, they, they could get stuff up and going much quicker than everybody else. And then again, you know, the cloud comes around and, and DevOps, cloud engineering, all this. And, uh, and, and we see kind of that shift again. But, you know, kind of the problem here, even for newer companies, uh, a lot of the stuff just never goes away. Uber hasn't been around that long. And you'd be right if you'd think Uber's a cloud first company, at least in terms of what's facing the drivers and, and the riders. So all the app related stuff, that's like a completely separate IT environment. It's very cloud first. Um, you know, it all runs in the cloud. But then when you look at their back office stuff, they're, they're a SAP customer. They have laser printers. They, you know, they've got Cisco switches and guest Wi-Fi. So they look very much like a traditional organization on, on the back end there. And literally those environments are run by, by different people, you know, uh, almost split into two completely separate organizations. And um, in the early days and even now, uh, I, I think that's true for a lot of tech companies and a lot of uh, companies who have kind of made this digital transformation switch. You know, they've ended up with uh, the new group and the the old tech group, kind of the legacy tech group. And uh, as we know, the, like the legacy stuff doesn't go away. Like that carries, you know, it, it almost sounds like a slur, you know, mainframers are still around. Um, you know, there, there's even a few dedicated uh, security mainframers out there who um, are, are fantastic to follow you know, and to, to watch their talks and, and look at the stuff that they're up to because uh, you know, that that platform is is still alive and well and uh, and they can be hacked and you can do you can do neat stuff with them. Um, but it, certainly it's becoming more complex and more difficult to manage all this stuff as, as the new technology shows up and old stuff often doesn't go away. So I mentioned digital transformation, which is, is pr probably, you know, I, I don't know where you fall on, on the, the scale of being sick of the term or not, but for a long time, I, I, I really didn't have any idea what it meant. And um, 
I love this guy. He's, uh, you know, if you look for digital transformation cartoons, you'll you'll get Tom Fish, Fishburne and his Mark Tunis stuff. Uh, used to get his his newsletter, and and he really nails a lot of this stuff. I couldn't decide on the favorites favorite, so I just I put a bunch in here. But um, but yeah, it's it, it's funny how older companies just kind of let this sneak up on them, you know, and and they knew it was important. They knew they should be doing something with it, but Nobody could really, or, or not a lot of people could really effectively explain what it was. And then, you know, we, we just hit this point where all of a sudden it became kind of obvious. You know, when we started seeing companies like like uh, Uber just eating other people's lunches and, uh, you know, this disruption cycle that we would typically see in business happening shorter and shorter. You know, so I think, you know, Netflix have effectively drove blockbuster video and, and Hollywood video uh, under in, in something like five years. You know, BlackBerry, you know, basically had to give up on, on phones largely, you know, in, in probably about five years after iPhone and Android came out. And they, they refused to get rid of their keyboards uh, and kept insisting that physical keyboards had to be a thing. Um, who else am I thinking of here? Um, yeah, so Ubers replaced taxis, you know, like, like from start of the company to more than 50% of taxi rides being Ubers in something like five years. Um, so yeah, at some point here, you know, people started to piece all these together and, and realize, uh, I feel like I missed one there. What happened? Ah. So the end key is very close to my right arrow key. So I went to the end of the presentation. That was amazing. Bear with me. No. Current slide being this slide. Yeah, so um, so yeah, then COVID hits and uh, things change uh, quite, quite a bit faster. I, I don't think it's quite that dramatic. Um, it depends on what company you work for, I guess. Uh, for some companies, it, it was really dramatic. Um, for Zoom, they had a pretty dramatic year. But uh, yeah, people people had to catch up pretty soon. So when I look at what makes all this possible, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because it's also what makes uh, ransomware and current extortion uh, attacks possible, but you know, most technology is dual use, you know, so the stuff that helps businesses be more agile and, and, and work better, uh, also helps, uh, you know, the, the bad guys as well, you know, they, they've learned to take advantage of it also. So, um, yeah, obviously always on internet, you know, then we got, uh, uh, compute and storage that you could rent for pennies and, uh, smartphones were important because apps, uh, apps became hugely important for emerging use cases. Uh, and even just two or three years out, like it became difficult to imagine what people were going to do with some of these technologies. Uh, so we, we found ourselves in the state of just constantly being, being surprised by new stuff popping up. Uh, you know, v VR just kind of slammed in from nowhere. And, you know, people weren't sure if it was going to catch on, how big it was going to be. Um, you know, uh, NFTs show up and, and Beeple sells uh, an NFT for, or a pile of NFTs for like $68 million. People lose their minds and, and then nothing, you know, kind of fizzles after that. Yeah, I know, I know it still exists today, but uh, I love watching these trends. Uh, but generally, these are kind of the foundational keystones. Um, and some of them are technologies, but some of them are concepts like DevOps isn't really any one technology. It, it, it's a way of, uh, of building applications and, and building infrastructure and, and all that. Um, a way of delivering IT, I guess you could say. And then, um, you know, some of the ones that, you know, from us technical folks might not think of as much, uh, ad tech was a, a huge one. The obscene reach that they got from social media, uh, you know, and, and other, you know, apps, things like that. Uh, the the amount of people you can reach overnight, you know, just just by spending some ad dollars is, is crazy. And then venture capital, since uh, I'd say about 2015 is when I saw it blow up. When, 
you know, it used to be single digit million series A was a big deal. Uh, and then all of a sudden you'd laugh at single digit million series A's. And, and now we're seeing like $50 million series A, which um, to those not uh, not familiar with the, the lingo, series A is your first big raise. Uh, you might do a seed round before that, but uh, the first big VC raise is, is a series A. And you're generally expected to raise every 18 months after that. So we're seeing companies raise $50 million and then go to raise money again 18 months later. Uh, when I think about that, I mean, it's almost difficult to figure out how to spend that money that quick. Uh, but companies are doing it and uh, uh, in, in at record speed. You know, I think just in the cybersecurity world, uh, we've seen something like 120 companies get acquired in the last three months. So... So yeah, it's that that machine is is constantly churning and, and moving. But uh, but yeah, so the reasons for it, you know, I, it's business. You know, a lot of it goes back to business and and the ability to compete. You know, so speed is is huge, and because this is important to business, it all filters down into IT and security, and that's that's why we're talking about all this stuff. So it filters all the way down to uh, your job roles and how you do your job and how you're graded on your performance in your job. Um, it, it all starts with uh, how important speed is. And, and of course, there's good and bad about that. Um, not everybody's comfortable moving at these speeds. And, uh, and we, we kind of see uh, organizations and even within organizations, like I said before, people splitting out into, into separate groups here. Um, yeah, I think I've got a couple other things here. Yeah, I thought this was, uh, Mark Andreessen says a lot of prescient stuff. Of course, you know, software, I guess, ate the world at this point. I think we're uh, a little over like, like 10 years and a month since he first said software was going to eat the world. And it's, um, it's kind of true, right? Like, like it's, it's, um, it's more than just software though. You know, it's, it's, it's more this, this approach to how we use software. Um, but also him talking about cycle time. You know, so a lot of it is about trying things that work and don't work. Like I mentioned, you know, overnight I can reach, you know, maybe a billion people uh, with ads. Uh, I can also find out in that same 24 hour period, if my ads are going to do well or not, you know, so cycle time, the amount of time it takes for you to learn if uh, if something failed or if it was successful uh, is is huge. And again, that filters down into IT and and into security. You know, we'll we'll, we'll get a little bit deeper into that as we go on. But you know that that um, ability to get instant feedback is is possibly one of the biggest here. You know, because um, you know, I mean, BlackBerry. You know, boy, they could have used that back in the day when they were dead set on on keeping physical keyboards. You know, it would have been nice if they could just uh, some of their folks could run some surveys and say, well, actually, <laughs> turns out people are, you know, they, they kind of like the the soft, the soft keyboards. Um, but I don't know. You know, the, the co-CEOs back then, you know, might have been just just emotionally locked into it and dead set on it. <clears throat> yeah, so also, um, I think this one tweet, and this is way back in 2014, this is already seven years ago, um, I think kind of sums it up, you know, the, the, the change that we saw, you know, used to take uh, weeks to, to get a Dell pizza box delivered to us, you know, and, and now we're building an entire product in, the, in that same time period. And, and it happened really, really quick, too. It was almost wish whiplash how how quick that uh, that started to happen. Of course, you know we still buy those boxes, but you know it's it's different now. You know what we use them for, how we use them, you know how we make the decision whether or not to to run stuff in our own infrastructure versus in the cloud. Um, you know, I, I think one of the takeaways uh, from this today is, is that um, it's never going to be 100% one thing or the other. You know, it's always going to be a mix, you know, so all the X is dead, 
you know, uh, blog posts that, that we've seen over the years, you know, it's, it, it's just, it's kind of pointless because, um, you know, we're stuck with most of that forever uh, to some extent. Uh, it's interesting. I'm giving a talk tomorrow on Equifax, uh, you know, and that's kind of the story of how they, they ended up getting, getting breached is they had too much of everything, you know, like, like, you know, their legacy stuff had legacy stuff. It, it was, it was just insane. You know, they, they own 75,000 publicly routable IP addresses. Like <laughs> how, how do you even monitor all that? But, um, but yeah, so, so again, you know, the, it's more than an, anal an analogy here. Like, like we're getting these benefits from these changes. You know, technology uh, moves fast. Startups, DevOps, attackers move fast. Uh, and, and we really find ourselves, at least in security, I think this can somewhat extend to, to parts of IT. Uh, we, we just haven't kept up with that pace. Um, you know, when security controls, you know, say, you know, you've got some kind of inline control, whether it be an email security gateway or an IPS or something like that. It takes the attacker a day to figure out how to how to bypass, you know, and how to evade uh, prevention controls there. Uh, and then it's it's going to take that vendor maybe six months uh, to catch up with that evasion and, and and to stop it. You know, and and we used to see this leapfrog just for years, where, you know, okay, you're going to detect, detect my malware. I'm going to put it in a zip file. You know, and then six months later, uh, you know, they're now exploring zip files, you know, but only one level deep. So the attacker puts the zip file two levels deep and on and on and on. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's not a good game to play. We want to be playing chess, not leapfrog, you know, so, and a lot of that has to do with how we think about it. So we gained all these new tricks. I, I remember when I first joined 451 Research, which is an industry analyst firm that uh, competes with the likes of Gartner and Forrester. Uh, I got to go, well, I was covering cloud security, you know, which was still fairly new, uh, putting security on the end of cloud. And uh, AWS reInvent was in its second year and I, I got to go to number two through number five. And it, it was my favorite conference ever, ever. Like there was no legacy vendor there, vendors there. Everything was new. The ideas were new. The products were new. What they were doing with them was new. And and it just kind of fed that that need uh, my brain has for for seeing new things and and seeing how they work. And just a lot of these concepts uh, that were coming out were things that you know just would have never occurred to me you know, and, and, and just blew my mind, like like the idea of immutability, you know, where when you promote a workload to production, there's no SSH, there's no RDP, there's no way to connect into that instance uh, to change anything on it. If you want to change anything, you you destroy it and you replace it with uh, another uh, workload that has the changes you want in it, you know, from, from QA or, or, you know, wherever that pipeline comes from. Um, you know, the, the idea of uh, guardrails, automation, I, I, I think is one of the big hurdles we're going to have in security is getting to this point to where we're comfortable enough with our, our detective controls and, uh, you know, a lot of our, our security controls to let things happen in an automated way to where we're shutting down and replacing instances automatically. Um, and obviously we, we have to put guardrails around the guardrails because if the bad guys find out that they can do a thing that causes our systems to shut down, then it becomes a denial of service vulnerability <laughs> that we've built into our, our own systems. So even those have to have, have guardrails. And I know folks that do that today and that's, that's absolutely what they, what they'll do. You know, the, there's a certain percentage that they're willing to shut down and replace, uh, you know, but it's never going to be a hundred percent you know, because then that, that can be abused. Um, the age of assets is an interesting one. I, I know places that uh, where they have rules that basically say, you know, no instances can live for longer than 10 days. Uh, passwords can't live for longer than an, in an hour. You know, when you have this, you know, this idea of infrastructure as code, you know, and this, uh, this management plane that, that you can automate everything through, 
uh, with that automation, you can start doing crazy stuff, you know, that, that would generally pull the rug out of, of an attacker's, uh, out from under their feet, you know, if they try to uh, persist in any of these environments or, or pivot through them. Uh, would would really frustrate them. And I think that's something that we generally tend to forget in security is, and in IT in general, is we, we've got full control of this environment. When an attacker comes in, they're depending on things, they're coming in blind. You know, like they get their initial foothold maybe through somebody clicking a link in an email or something like that. Beyond that, they're just hoping you've got default set in Windows, in Active Directory, in Kubernetes, um, you know, because they, they don't know what they're what they're going to be jumping into. So um, it, it's it's a big opportunity for us to give them some surprises. You know, to you know, deception is is a great example there uh, of a technology that that's uh, uh, you know fairly new. You know, there there's some products there. You know, you don't really need a product to do it. You know, but just the idea that you've got these trip wires for the bad guys to trip over. Uh, or just simple things like Windows installed in a, a non-default directory breaks a lot of malware. Um, and uh, kind of, again, this theme of thinking differently uh, about these things, uh, you find out that malware is actually really sensitive and really fragile. It really does depend on things being in, in certain places. Uh, in cases where they should be using global environment variables, they don't bother to. They, they hard code it because in 99.9% .9 of the cases, people don't change the defaults. You know, so, you know, they're lazy there and we can use that against them. Bad coding. Um, so another idea here, and this came from Sunil Yu, who is um, kind of, he head up the... Um, Skunk Works over at Bank of America in the security group. And if you don't know, the Bank of America security group is something like 3,000 people. They have their own CFO. It, it's it's completely insane. And uh, and they had a whole group that would just uh, take ideas and, and play with them. You know, and that, that was their job. And uh, one of the things he came up with was a new triad. Like we, we've got the, the typical old school confidentiality, integrity, and availability triad, uh, you know, that has worked, uh, you know, for the most part, you know, as, as a security metaphor, you know, for different things uh, for a couple decades. Um, but this new one he came up for uh, was kind of for this new world here where, uh, and it kind of, um, uh, zooms in on on three factors, three uh, uh, three things that that really kind of give uh, you know th this new infrastructure, this this new world, uh, the power um, um, you know th these new powers that security can use. Uh, but distributed, uh, you know, the the big thing there, and and even now a lot of systems are moving to hot patching. Uh, um, the ability to hot patch things without taking them down. But, you know, if, if you've got a, you know, highly distributed uh, architecture, you know, it doesn't really matter if you can hot patch or not, you know, you can, you can just patch, uh, you know, your, your system in, in groups without ever having to take it down, which uh, that alone is, is huge for security. You know, in, in my days, you know, we carried a pager and, and any kind of uh, change control window was always in the wee hours uh, on, on the weekend, you know, usually 3 a.m. Sunday is when our change window would begin. And uh, because that made sense, you know, let's take these systems down when our brains are at their least functional. And uh, <laughs> when when mistakes are, are, you know, we absolutely don't want to make mistakes. And now people can just do this stuff during the day. You know, they're doing production releases during the day. Why not patch during the day, too? Um, just makes sense from a, from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, we talked about Im immutability and then uh, ephemeral. You know, the idea that uh, I remember the first time somebody mentioned to me, you know, maybe somebody who's a sysadmin doesn't also need like full sysadmin access to the database that runs on the systems, you know, that they have root or administrator access to, you know, and, you know, that, that kind of goes, that idea um, kind of works with customer data too. Like I was a PCI QSA for many years, and 
oftentimes I'd see a light bulb go off when I explained what PCI cared about. I tell them, well, what it really cares about is the PAN, which is the credit card account number. Um, and um, once they realized that, they were, they were thinking through their, their workflows and they're like, you know what? I don't actually need the PAN. <laughs> you know, for my workflows, uh, if somebody calls in and, and uh, you know, has an issue with their transaction, you know, they're going to read that number to me. So I don't actually need to store it. I just need the ability to do a lookup on it. Um, you know, so people could use one-way hashes. They could use tokens. Um, you know, they, they, they realized they actually don't need to, to keep data for as long as they needed to keep it, or they only needed a, to keep a subset of that data. You know, so it really, and, and <laughs> you can say a lot of bad things about PCI. It's made a lot of mistakes, um, but it, in getting people to think about and, and to be less, have a less hoarder mindset of keeping all the, the data on the customers that they can, uh, it definitely helped with that and, and got people thinking more about, okay, what do I actually need? Uh, you know, for, for the business to thrive. And it turns out quite, quite a bit less than you think you need. Uh, and, and we could certainly use a lot more of that in, in the current age of, of ad tech and, uh, and devices collecting data. Um, you know, this, this is, uh, I just kind of threw this in here because, um, you know, we're also seeing security adopt this as well, you know, so this is kind of the classic, uh, uh, sketch that uh, Henrik Nyberg did uh, a long time ago to kind of explain the idea of um, a minimum viable product, and um, and it, it's also kind of a you know a, a way to think about the difference between waterfall wa waterfall and agile. You know the idea that you release a, a product with a few features. You know the iPhone didn't even have an app store when it first came out. You know, that didn't come out until year two or year three. Um, and then, you know, you just kind of gradually add, add them. But you come out with something usable and, and uh, you know, that, that has some functionality uh, right off. And, again, you know, we've, we've seen that uh, have a big impact on security where generally, and I don't think this just goes for security products, it goes for products in general. The longer a project goes on, uh, the more likely it is to either change the scope of what uh, the definition of, of success is, you know, so you, you, <laughs> you just uh, more and more willing to settle for less as, as the project goes past deadlines and past deadlines, um, you know, but also more likely for it to fail, you know, the longer and longer it goes on, you know, so these kind of uh, shorter cycles, these more compressed cycles uh, make a lot of sense. Uh, in, in whatever we do. All right, so getting into the actual practitioner role changes, I'm gonna take a break um, and just uh, take a drink real quick. Hope it doesn't offend anybody that I'm drinking a beer. And if you're curious, it's a Terrapin Luau Crunkle, which is uh, probably my favorite IPA of, of all time. All right. So back at a conference called Cloud Security World in 2016, I put together a presentation uh, somewhat similar to, to what I'm talking about today. Similar enough that when I went back and looked at it, uh, a lot of that stuff really hadn't changed. It, it was still uh, applicable today and, and still relevant today. So, uh, so I'm going to share some of those slides uh, because I, I haven't come up with a, a better way to visually kind of kind of get this uh, get this across. <clears throat> Put it in the chat. What the beer? I think I'm spelling that right. There we go. All right, that's the beer. <clears throat> yeah, so um, so this is kind of, you know, I mentioned earlier that security is the second layer on top of other stuff. You know, generally when you're talking about any kind of security, 
you know, database security, Windows security, uh, firmware security. You know, there, there's some modifier word, and security is is the second layer on top of that. So, you know, firmware security can't exist without uh, firmware. Um, and when I think about the kind of the, the the changes that we've seen both to security's role and to IT, you know, a lot of it has been um, eliminating some of these layers. And oh yeah, so I said that right there. <clears throat> and so, you know, back in the day, I, I I felt very strongly that security wasn't a field you could go directly into. You know, so this is kind of a, a remnant of that. I, I'm not as sure about that statement these days. You know, I used to say, okay, if you're going to be an expert in firmware security, you should know something about firmware first. You know, crazy idea. Um, you know, but more and more, we we are seeing security roles like SOC roles and stuff like that, where, you know, it, it's, um, yeah, okay. You know, yeah, I can see some entry level roles there. You're you're still going to have to know something about IT and and the underpinnings here, but, uh, you know maybe you don't have to go work as a sysadmin for four or five years before getting into one of those roles. So, but kind of the, you know, the, the point here is this uh, kind of underlying stack here that we, we begin to remove. So as I mentioned before, um, security is never going to be big enough to cover everything. Uh, you know, if, if people are, you know, expecting us to, to be able to, uh, to address all this stuff, <clears throat> um, it, it's not going to happen. You know, we've we've got to have help from uh, from other people in IT, whether those are, you know, security champions. I've heard that term used, or you know, security leads. You know, somewhere where maybe security isn't their full time job. It's just uh, they're the one that's the most security minded. That's keeping an eye out. You know, for for stuff that's significant, is is more the model here. <clears throat> it's not really the focus of this talk, so I'm gonna I'm gonna blow through that uh, a little bit more quickly. Um, yeah, so going cloud first, you know, we start to eliminate some of these layers. Is is what I'm showing here. <clears throat> infrastructure infrastructure heavy security skill sets start to start to disappear in in these organizations, and, and you don't see the storage admins, the database admins. You know, you see more full stack folks, folks that, that know how to do as much as they need to of each of those. <clears throat> yeah, and that's kind of the, that's another key uh, concept as we go through this talk that, uh, and, and it sounds kind of obvious that when tech changes, IT changes, and then security changes. So really it's important for security to, uh, I, I, so bimodal IT, that, that was a term that didn't really stick around. I don't think I've heard it since I used it in this, um, um, in this uh, presentation. I, I don't remember what it meant. Um, maybe it's, um, is it that separation I'm talking about of, of cloud versus traditional IT? Okay, the, the definition I found is is uh, not helpful. Mode one and mode two. Uh, that's a Gartner term, figures. That's what I get for using a Gartner term. Uh, <laughs> practically made a career out of, out of uh, rewriting Gartner definitions and making it more understandable, so. <clears throat> Okay, so mode one, yeah, so kind of, I guess, you know, it's talking about bimodal. I mentioned Bank of America, so Neil Yu was, was over the skunk works, so that would be mode two, you know, so I guess Bank of America was kind of following that bimodal uh, process where you, you've got your normal ops folks, um, you're optimizing for, for the existing technologies and areas. And then you've got, uh, you know, basically the the group that's trying out all the new stuff to see see what sticks. I guess that works as a definition. Um, 
Yeah, so whoop, I hit the end key again. All right, back. So yeah, that um, you know, as as those layers go away, you know, so does you know the importance of security for those layers as well. I mean, the understanding this, the concept and the skills, you know, being able to to read Wireshark is, I, I think, always going to be important uh, for security. You know, but you start to see these as dedicated roles go away, is is really what I'm saying here. Uh, the knowledge is still useful though. And um, so, you know, this is more of what we're seeing in, in like cloud first organizations, you know, where, you know, security is uh, oftentimes they're, they're people with developer backgrounds, with AppSec backgrounds that you see in a lot of cloud first organizations because so much of that, the infrastructure layer, the, uh, the platform layer is, is uh, you know, offloaded somewhere else. And, um, you know, so most of what you're building that's custom, you know, is is code, is, is uh, application code, usually web app application code, mobile code. You know, so so a lot of these organizations, their their first security hire isn't going to be a CISO necessarily. It's it's going to be somebody with with more of an app appsec mindset and, and role. And um, <clears throat> let's see. Yeah, and that relationship between security and developers is pretty crucial in, in those uh, situations. Gone is the idea of, uh, you know, I can take two months to do a, an architecture review or something like that. Um, you know, and the benefit here, you know, yes, we don't have time to mull things over as much in, in kind of this new world, um, but we're also involved more in, in the design side of things. You know, so security much more commonly gets, gets uh, built in rather than bolted on in this new model. And yes, yeah, security can't impact delivery schedule. That's always uh, something funny. Like you talk to anybody in any kind of cloud first organization and suggest that they kind of stop the uh, the conveyor belt, you know, the the uh, the CI CD pipeline and uh, and and the laugh. So kind of my my concept here you know, is, um, yeah, as I mentioned before, moving security responsibilities back out to the SMEs within each of these uh, these roles here. And the the security team becomes more of a uh, an advisory or almost like an in internal consulting group, you know, uh, and we've seen this at, at many levels, like for example, uh, vulnerability management. In, in a lot of these uh, cases, security team doesn't do anything with vulnerability management. Uh, the only time they're involved is if somebody has a question, you know, say, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if this is a false positive or not. Could you, could you help me figure that out? Or, you know, I've, I've got the, the bandwidth to fix two of these three vulnerabilities. Can you help me prioritize them? You know, which two of the three should I, should I prioritize? Uh, that, that kind of thing, you know, but uh, vulnerability management is so integrated into the, into the uh, the pipeline and the workflow um, that it's it's not really you know there's gone is this idea of okay security is going to scan our stuff and then throw a, a you know email us a PDF when they're done <clears throat> which which can only be a good thing right uh, and and when you compare some of these job roles um, there there are some commonalities you know with the old versus the new and. and all, all this stuff on, on the next slides coming up came directly out of uh, uh, job job postings. Um, you know, forensics is still a thing. The way it's done is very different. You know, I see a lot of like, like in the cloud. Um, you know, there, there's a, a set of scripts that will basically can take an instance, um, quarantine it, contain it. Um, you know, save the image boot up a, you know, a machine with the forensics tools on it, load the image into that, uh, do the initial analysis, like all that's happening automatically at the push of a button. You know, basically you're telling a script, uh, the instance name or the instance ID and, and all the rest of that just happens automatically. It gets uh, thrown into this forensics environment. Um, but yeah, most of the rest of it's different these days. Um, <clears throat> And definitely, you know, something that was uh, a real battle for years in security, you know, 
a lot of folks, at least 10 years ago in security, really pushed back hard on learning to code. Um, and so back then we would say, you know, at the very least, you need to be able to, you, you need to have a, a scripting language under your belt, some kind of uh, interpreted language like like Python or, or, you know, I'm trying to pick another one that won't get me laughed at. <laughs> we'll just go with Python, okay? <laughs> um, because it's still one of the most popular on the security side today. Uh, but certainly I, I see a lot of these cloud first security teams and they're they're doing a lot more than that. Uh, yeah, tickle. <laughs> but um yeah, they're they're doing a lot more than than just uh that stuff. They're they're building entire apps with front ends. Um, you know, it's it's uh, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but it's a common thing to see tech companies and uh, even non-tech companies like Capital One and, and folks like that that have, have really gone hard into DevOps and cloud uh, publish their own, you know, open source software regularly. They, they've got their own GitHub, you know, they've got uh, dozens of, of repos. Uh, they're building security tools and sharing them with people. Uh, I think I, I do get into that in the upcoming slide here, but it's, um, um, and that's really an effect of this this new security practitioner that's uh, a builder. You know, we're not buying, going out and buying a product for everything. Uh, you know, for a lot of these needs, either the product isn't there yet, you know, and, and we, we don't have the time to wait on it. Uh, so we kind of have to build it if we want to be able to have the, the controls we want or have it integrate the way that we want into the rest of our tooling. <clears throat> So some examples of, of the uh, the experience and skills, and, and uh, this is from 2016. Uh, so it hasn't changed too much. You know, some of these have probably changed. Um, you know, Ruby on Rails, that's probably gone. You know, I, th I think that's officially, I think it's this month they've officially killed it off. Um, and it's, it's out of support now. And uh, yeah, some of these others maybe haven't aged well. But you generally get the idea, like you do a find replace, like in, instead of XML, JSON, some of these, maybe we'd see YAML. Um, <clears throat> but generally it's still moving in the same direct direction. You know, these, these are still skills they're expecting security folks to have. <clears throat> so yeah, absolutely. Containers, microservices. Um, but yeah, the, the underlying point here is learn to write learn to write code. Um, yeah, and the nice thing is, you know, if, uh, for people wanting to get into security here, like those tools are out there, you know, almost almost all this stuff is free, um, you know, or, or you can play around with for, for pennies. Um, <clears throat> and automation is, is kind of a key focus here. And I, I think this uh, this kind of, you know, I can replace you with a shell script kind of thing has never really gone away. It just kind of moves, you know, the, the, the ball on that uh, uh, just kind of moves up layers. And it's kind of the same thing with pets versus cattle. Like, like we talk about pets versus cattle as if Netflix and Etsy don't have any pets anymore. They only have cattle. And I don't think that's true. I, you know, I think they do have pets you know, but the, you know, they're, they're just lower in the layers, you know, they, they've kind of moved down. So like if you're using AWS, you know, the AWS account, that management plane, um, you know, that, that's your, that's your pet now, you know, that doesn't get blown away on a regular basis. You know, that, that same AWS account and that account ID sticks around for years and, and the configuration there, you know, won't often change, um, you know, but certainly the things running within that account maybe those are refreshed uh, once an hour, once every 10 days, you know, what, what, whatever that, that frequency is. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, again, some, some good examples here. And, uh, you know, I've kind of uh, intentionally used old examples here because I, I think they still apply today. Um, you know, we, we, we got this, uh, this quick rush into this new, and, and certainly there, there's, I think growing jobs might, might, uh, might change quite a bit. Uh, you know, but um, it was kind of, a, I think, a hard shift to this new reality. You know, in, in Agile was was probably the biggest piece of that. 
uh, you know, because it changed the speed at which we work. And um, as I mentioned before, a lot of these uh, specialized uh, administration, you know, areas of administration, you know, s start to go away, but never really fully go away, like I said before. So I don't know if dying jobs works. It's just, um, you know, kind of like what you were saying, Andy, about Ruby and Rails. You know, they're not dying, but they're not growing either. So I mentioned before, you know, this is an example from Cloudflare. They built a tool called Flanscan. Uh, Netflix has a ton of security stuff. Uh, you know, stethoscope, scumbler, security monkey. Um, so it's just kind of, uh, you know, just a general collection of other things that were worth mentioning. Uh, you know, I think, you know, the, the art of selling, the ability to, um, you know, look at a proposal or, you know, an idea you have for, for improving security or, or maybe you feel it's really important to, to buy a certain product or platform or something like that. Um, it's something I've really seen lacking in, in practitioner roles. You know, it's especially in security, you know, for a, lot, a long time, there's this idea of, well, because security like that, do I need any other reason? You know, we're, we're all going to get hacked. And it's just, it's not good enough. Uh, these days in, in a lot of organizations. Um, and, and that goes across the gamut, you know, old school organizations, new organizations, uh, you, you've got to be able to talk around, you know, how, how you're going to justify the cost, you know, why it's important, um, you know, and, and, and how you're going to keep it up and running. You know, a lot of, a lot of folks, uh, when they, when they build tools in house or when they buy products, you know, they, they often don't think about the operational overhead, you know, so that that's a skill that I've, I've kind of seen, uh, you know, the ability to both sell it and to manage it, you know, uh, you know, are things that I've, I've definitely seen missing. And, and you can learn a lot of those skills outside of IT and, and uh, security entirely. You know, there's a lot of good uh, speakers and, and books out there, you know, that, that kind of talk about how to do those, those things, because those are more, um, you know, it's it's more about uh, you know working within your organization, working with coworkers, uh, social skills, uh, soft skills, that 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 kind of stuff. Uh, but it's it's super important. You know, I, I hate the term soft skills because it's <laughs> makes it sound as if it's uh, somehow lesser. You know, but uh, I I know folks that excel in in their in their field, incredibly technical folks. But the reason they excel has nothing to do with their technical expertise. It's because they can explain things really well. They can justify it. They've got charisma. You know, they they can convince people that their ideas are good ideas. That kind of stuff, which is uh, I th I think can be tough for some of us that that don't naturally come by that that sort of thing. But you can learn those skills. Um, the fact that I'm I'm giving this talk is is proof of that. Uh, I'm not a natural speaker, at all. Um, and then. Um, yeah, so giving back, uh, corporate GitHub's talked about that. Security chaos engineering, I think, is was interesting enough to be worthy of a few slides. Um, so Aaron Reinhardt and Kelly Shortridge put together this book talking about security chaos engineering. Uh, obviously, if you're familiar with chaos engineering, you know, or site reliability engineering, it uh, it builds on that definitely. But again. You know, one of the major themes of this talk is that it's really all about um, changing your way of thinking. And chaos engineering is, is a big one there. And, and the big change in thinking is, you know, traditionally we try to avoid any kind of failure. And the problem with that is we don't know what the mode of failure looks like until it actually happens, uh, typically at an inconvenient time, uh, you know, that, that we don't want it to happen. So the idea of chaos engineering, you know, and, and, and the term is slightly misleading. It's it's not chaos. It's I guess you could call it controlled chaos. Uh, you know, so it might make you think of uh, stuff like Chaos Monkey. You know, uh, uh, Netflix has this whole group of tools called Simian Army. You know, and the idea is, you know, what what would happen if we just let a monkey in the server room? They just start pulling cables and stuff like that. You know, would we fail and you know, would we be prepared for those kinds of failures? Um, because unpredictable failures are, are pretty much guaranteed, you know, so why not try to force them to happen and and then be able to plan and prepare for those? 
And um, I kind of think of it like fuzzing, but at a more macro level. You know, you're fuzzing at the application and well, no, fu normal fuzzing is at the application level. You're fuzzing at, at like the the architecture level, at the platform, at the infrastructure level. You know, you're you're um, uh, disabling systems. You know, uh, cutting off connections between between different systems. Uh, you know, DRBCP I think is a classic example of this. Uh, I used to work with a lot of companies on DRBCP, and I've written my own DRBCP plans. And I still firmly believe that if you've never actually thrown the switch on your BCP plan to whatever your DR environment is, um, you probably know about half of uh, what needs to happen. The other half you haven't anticipated and you won't realize that until you throw that switch and you see all the things that, that break. And um, it's just being able to cycle through failure modes is necessary to get the confidence you need to be able to sleep at night. You know, and th this doesn't just go for availability situations. It goes for security as well. You know, there's tools out there that simulate ransomware attacks. You know, wh why not test it and see what would happen in your environment in a controlled way that doesn't do any damage? You know, there, there's really not a good reason not to. You know, the uh, Infection Monkey is a free tool that you can use. Uh, Gardacore is a commercial company that makes it, but it's totally open source. Uh, it, it mimics uh, malware, uh, typically ransomware with a worm component, uh, has all kinds of little uh, um, uh, configuration features. You can feed it you know, a list of passwords or something like that. Let it loosen your environment without worrying about it doing any damage. And it comes back with a nice report, lets you know how, how widely it was able to spread itself, uh, you know, what systems it was able to get into and uh, gives you a chance for your existing security controls, uh, you know, to, to maybe stop it, you know, do something about it. You know, if you've got some behavior-based like EDR controls, something like that, um, I, I'd be concerned if, if I released Infection Monkey into what I thought was a mature security and, you know, uh, an environment with mature security controls and, and not get any emails or alerts after setting it loose. Um, so yeah, controlled failure. Um, the more you fail, the more you learn. You know, so why not do it on our terms rather than uh, than uh, uh, you know just letting it happen naturally and and uh, having to update your resume or whatever. <clears throat> so yeah, confidence is a big one, and, and I think that's a big thing that separates uh, security teams. You know, a lot, lot of security teams and organizations have high turnover. Uh, and, and a lot of it is because, you know, they, they, they don't have this, you know, good cohesive plan on, uh, on how to handle a lot of the stuff. And I think a lot of it does go back to testing. Uh, goes back to know, knowing what tools you have, um, being comfortable with those tools. And, and generally, you know, sometimes you see organizations where they've got one of everything they're never going to be comfortable. They're never going to be confident, you know, because they, you know, every time a new tool comes out, every time their reseller comes to them, you know, Optiv wants to take them out to lunch or whatever, uh, they find themselves buying another thing, you know, and, um, and when the breach happens, you know, uh, I study breaches uh, and, and you see these companies that had one of everything and they were all misconfigured. <laughs> And even, you know, maybe some of them sent alerts uh, to the people, but they didn't respond because they had never trained for it, you know. So it, in a way, you can kind of think about security like, like a sport. Um, I think PCI, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, requirement for, you know, if you take credit card numbers, you've got to be PCI compliant, I think requires uh, one incident response test a year. And uh, if we think of it like a sport, how good are you going to be at a sport, especially a team sport, if you practice once a year? Yeah. And, you know, thinking of it that way, go look at the headlines and try to be surprised. Oh, sorry. Am I running long? I didn't have a clock up. Yeah. Sorry about that. I, I am actually at the end, Chris. Um, you know, this is, uh, I think I've only got one slide or two slides after this. So yeah, this is kind of the bottom line if you want to understand where security is going. Um, 
you know, you should you should follow IT trends and changes. So I, I, I guess I had a lot of messages in this, um, but yeah, that's definitely one of them. You know, I talk to a lot of security people that avoid um, new things, you know, because the new things aren't secure yet. Uh, I'm like, okay, you know, so for for your own security, your own personal stuff, that's fine. But you're also not learning anything about any of these new things, you know, by, you know, effectively being being a Luddite. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they talk about it as, as if it's bragging rights, but I think it's important uh, for security folks to take measured risks and to try out new things, you know, because, uh, you know, that, that'll make them, you know, put them in a better position to be able to help the companies they work for and the, and the people that they help uh, un understand how to navigate those risks. You know, and, and in a lot of cases, you're, you're finding vulnerabilities right off the bat as you're using a lot of these new tools. <clears throat> and you can report those and help it help it get better. Um, so yeah, I thought I was going to have more resources here, but uh, really, a lot of them were just uh, attached to the slides as I was going through them. Um, this is a webcast I did um, right about is that a month ago? Yeah, just about a month ago. And this is the um, uh, it was with the guy who's the the head of cloud engineering at uh, Tanium, and uh, just a great conversation about how they do cloud security, you know, and and uh, you know some of the lessons they've learned. You know, I think they went from uh, they they converted to SaaS in something like 18 months. You know, the big product, lot lot of customers. Um, you know, huge product with tons of features and modules and stuff like that. So it was a big deal for them to go to, uh, you know, to to a SaaS model in in 18 months. And, and he's he's the guy that that took him there. So um, good good follow up to this because it goes into a lot more details than I went into here on kind of what what some of those new roles look like. Um, I I let PowerPoint design the slide. And uh, yeah, clearly that's that's an email icon on the right hand side. Those look like coconuts with with uh, I don't know glitter falling out of them. I'm not I'm not sure why why that's next to uh, my Twitter handle. So anyway, <laughs> thank you. Um, that's that's all I've got today. If you have any questions, I can hang out for a bit. I'm uh, not seeing any questions at the moment, but uh, we do have the uh, the time that we would normally spend going to the watering hole so we can bring the watering hole to this, right, to Remo here in our meeting. So um, uh, I want to thank Adrian so very much for taking time out to speak with us. And it was a great talk and I really enjoyed it. It was very informative. And uh, I give you a uh, my applause. Um, and I'm sure everybody else is applauding too. Yep, there we go. We're applauding. I see more applause coming up. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it wasn't too rambly. Uh, generally, no. uh, yeah. It was great. So, and we, you know, we've got, you know, until 10 o'clock on the Remo app. So, uh, oh, wait, we've got a question. We've got a question in the Q&A panel here. Oh, nice. Oh, would DevOps be part of purple teaming anywhere? Yeah, so I mean, purple teaming generally applies to anything anywhere. You know, it's basically people who understand and can simulate the attacks, helping people defend against those attacks. So I think that's that's the easiest way to put it. So if if your organization is DevOps heavy, uh, yeah, you better believe they should be part of a, a purple teaming exercise. Yeah, and, and that's one of those things is. Um, Security, I've heard a lot of people say this, you know, enough that I believe it at this point, that DevSecOps or Sec DevOps is, is kind of redundant, you know, that uh, it's already implied that security should be part of the DevOps role, you know, so so ab absolutely. Um, if you've got DevOps, if, if that's a part of your culture, then it should absolutely be involved in a purple teaming exercise. 
I hope that answers the question. Excellent. So we definitely have more opportunities. Uh, you know, like Adrian said, he's going to hang out for a little bit with us. Uh, so we're going to return to the tables now. Uh, Adrian, again, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and, uh, and appreciate this talk.